Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you're located. Uh, warm welcome uh, for uh, uh, to our session of, in the series of the RightCon discussion, our Wednesday web chats on uh, this today on business economy and uh, livelihood in uh, a COVID-19 or post-COVID-19 world, whatever we would like to coin. We have an excellent uh, group of panelists and speakers and I based on our experience from previous discussions, an excellent uh, audience. Therefore, we can expect very interactive and dynamic discussion on this important issue, which is a pressing issue of, uh, of our time. My name is Jovan Kurbalia. I'm executive director of uh, Diplo Foundation and head of Geneva Internet Platform. And uh, I will be moderating today's session today, uh, together with Mark Limon, executive director of the Universal Rights Group. Uh, just to start, I have uh, some uh, good news and some bad news. Let me start probably with bad news. Bad news is that this is the last session in our series of uh, right on uh, meetings. This is a 10th session. We started it uh, with the outbreak of the uh, COVID-19 pandemics. And uh, I guess many of you follow the most of the, our sessions and uh, dealing with various aspects of human rights. Well, this is bad news that we will pause for some time. Good news is that uh, we will be back. We will be back in September with our uh, monthly, monthly events and mainly trying to uh, uh, cover uh, uh, dynamics and the issues that post-COVID world uh, is going to face when it comes to human rights. We have been thrilled to see the worldwide interest generated by these weekly discussions on the various human rights implication uh, of the current pandemic. And uh, we have been uh, really honored to welcome great speakers from all walks of life and have uh, been encouraged by dynamic participation of the wider public in our chat room. And I'm sure this will be the case today. For all of these reasons and considering the importance of the Building Black, we are continuing uh, in uh, September. Turning to today's discussion, uh, we have an eminent group of expert speakers and uh, uh, well over 100 participants uh, here in the Zoom room, but also in Facebook and uh, at YouTube where we will be broadcasting uh, today's events. <coughs> Let us just quickly reflect on uh, the breakout of participants over the last uh, 10, uh, 10 uh, sessions of the Right On. As you can see, Around 39 uh, of you and the previous participants are from governments and international organizations, followed by attendees from NGO with uh, approximately 24% uh, academia with roughly 20% uh, and the rest up to 100 was covered by media, tech community and the private sector. It has been generally multi-stakeholder discussion uh, reflecting uh, different views what we wanted to do beyond views beyond the Geneva human rights uh, dynamics, views from uh, all continents, views from the all stakeholder groups, and in particular, um, weak stakeholder marginalized group, which are the most affected by uh, COVID-19 crisis. This is the general uh, stage for today's discussion. Last in the series, uh, announcement of the more of the similar discussions in September, genuinely multi-stakeholder participation, and uh, I would say nice legacy that we will be leaving for the future discussion on human rights uh, and security, economy, uh, and uh, other aspects of our modern life. I will now hand over uh, to Mark to introduce the topic uh, of today's discussion. Mark, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Jovan. It's great to be back here and to see so many familiar faces. <coughs> um, I have to say I'm a little bit sad. I mean, it's gone so fast these 10 weeks. Um, I joined at the beginning with a bit of trepidation because I'd never done this kind of Zoom meeting before, but I've really enjoyed it. Uh, and I think I've enjoyed it most for the reason you just alluded to, Jovan. Uh, because it really has allowed us to widen the conversation on human rights, 
not only in a COVID uh, context, but also more generally. Uh, we often see the same people, and I like all of those people, so I don't want to upset them, uh, but we see the same people week in, week out. And so it's been great to see comments and questions from people in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Asia, even in the Pacific sometimes, which is incredible because it must be about two o'clock in the morning over there, or even later, four or five in the morning. Um, as you said, Jovan, we're, today we're talking about business, economy, and rights. Uh, often people might not think those things are related to human rights, but very clearly they are, especially to economic and social rights. Um, and really we're talking about the current situation. So as countries reopen their economies and put in place strategies to recover better from this pandemic, it's vital that we both learn the lessons from the crisis but also really to build back better based on those lessons, whether it's in terms of businesses, governments, or any other stakeholders. If we don't, of course, then this small window of opportunity we have will be lost. And that would be a tragedy, I think, because we really do have the chance uh, to do things in a different way. Uh, and I think that window of opportunity will last a few months rather than years. Um, so if we don't, we risk slipping back into that status quo ante with underpaid and undervalued jobs, including among the frontline workers that many of us have been clapping every week. Um, we'll see again certain multinationals, especially digital and internet companies, making huge profits, yet failing to invest in well-paid jobs or in wider society, including through fair tax systems. We'll see governments again turning blind eyes to tax avoidance uh, with the offshoring of manufacturing jobs and inadequate investments in education and training for the jobs of tomorrow. We'll see again, and we are already seeing it, a return to high employment in many places, especially high youth unemployment. Um, and we'll see a return very quickly, and I think we're already seeing that in, in China and elsewhere back to a dependence on fossil fuels, back to pollution, back to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, instead of doing what we should be doing, which is investing in a Green New Deal. So to discuss these two points, what lessons to draw from the crisis when it comes to human rights, especially economic and social rights, jobs, the economy and business. Um, we have a great, as you said, panel of discussants. I'll very quickly introduce them, and then we'll go into questions um, moderated first by Jovan. Uh, so first of all, we have, we're very fortunate and honored to have Deborah Greenfield, who's Deputy Director General for Policy at the International Labour Organization. We have from the private sector, Jean-Yves Art, who's Senior Director in charge of Strategic Partnerships at Microsoft. We have Professor Dorothy Bowen Pauli, who's Professor and Director of the Geneva Center for Business and Human Rights at Geneva University and Research Director at NYU Stern Center for Business and Human Rights. We have my good friend, Professor Michael Addo from Notre Dame Law School, who's also a former member of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. And last but not least, we have Ellen, and that is a very difficult surname. I should have checked. Beforehand, I'll try Wojnowski, uh, Deputy Director for Business and Human Rights at the Danish Institute for Human Rights. And I apologize, Ellen, for my awful pronunciation. As always with write on discussions though, what's especially important is audience participation. So I really encourage everybody on all the different platforms to comment, say if you agree, you don't agree, and very importantly, submit questions. We will then collate those questions and pose a selection of them to the experts. And we also, as previously, have a youth representative from the Model UN who will pose a question later to our colleague from the ILO. Um, so now that we've introduced the speakers, uh, we would like to hear from you uh, straight away, the audience, um, on the following survey question. So hopefully my colleagues from Diplo will show it. Do you agree with the decisions of Denmark, France and others to ban companies that are registered in tax havens 
from accessing financial aid during the coronavirus pandemic. I probably can guess how this will go, although there is somebody who said no already, but uh, while we wait for the, those poll results to come in, so please everybody tap your buttons, um, we'd like to share with you some data, which should be on your screens. And here you can see data from National COVID-19 Rescue Package as a percentage of the respective country's GDP. As you can see, Japan with, near, with just over 21% has established the largest rescue package compared to its GDP. It's followed by the US and Sweden. On the other hand, Spain, Italy and the UK are European countries that have been affected by the coronavirus the most. Um, but they've only allocated recovery funds that amount or represent between 5 and 7% of their GDP. Um, if you're listening to PMQs in the UK today, you won't see those figures, I guarantee that. Okay, so here's the poll results. 83% uh, um, think that these governments are right, and then presumably that governments that haven't banned money to tax havens, uh, companies to, that are based in tax havens um, are wrong. Um, interesting. It's interesting, especially the 7%, maybe those who voted that this is not a good policy can explain why they said that in the chat room. Jovan, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mark, for uh, setting the stage for our discussion. And we'll start immediately with, uh, with uh, Deborah. Uh, Deborah, you are Director General in his very passionate interview uh, for Al Jazeera, uh, literally called the governments and businesses worldwide to take care of the workers, to take care of jobs, and to do uh, much more uh, in order to protect uh, these fundamental rights of the peoples and communities worldwide. Therefore, the first question to you is, uh, did governments and businesses uh, do enough during the pandemic to protect and conserve jobs and to uh, safeguard social and the health uh, security of workers? Over to you, Deborah. Thanks very much for uh, for inviting me to the the last of your of your series, um, and uh, and also for the for the question. Yes, we are uh, led by our director general, uh, passionate about the need for governments and businesses to protect the rights of workers during the pandemic, and also to support enterprises, particularly uh, small and medium enterprises, which really cannot survive this crisis on their own. Uh, let me first start by saying, uh, and maybe I don't need to say this to this audience, but labor rights are human rights. And they are never more important than in a crisis because they are the underpinnings of policy that will lead to a sustainable recovery. But let's remind ourselves that uh, there is a particular role for government here as, uh, you know, it's become a truism, as the measures that were undertaken to stem the pandemic, the health crisis, drove this uh, devastation in both supply and demand. And so governments really have to play a huge role. And in many, uh, in many countries, particularly developed economies, as we saw on your chart, that's exactly what happens uh, and what, what has happened. They have the means and they have the infrastructure to deal with the urgency of the matter. And so we are seeing signs of moving from the rapid response to the early phases of, of a recovery, not just a health uh, recovery, but an economic recovery. But that required emergency financial assistance at all levels uh, to facilitate not only survival, but the ability to maintain levels of employment. Countries that have preserved the employment relationship, that is, for example, short-term work, where uh, reduced hours are spread through the workforce so that nobody is laid off, may be in a stronger position to, um, to recover better. Countries with very strong social protection systems 
we're able to leverage those and expand those. And they are, uh, and they are in a better situation in terms of recovery. But the picture is far bleaker in developing and emerging economies that don't have the funds, that don't have the infrastructure, that don't have the social protection systems, that have huge uh, populations in the informal economy, they're in catastrophic situations. And this is where global solidarity comes in. They simply can't do it on their own. And so um, this is why we have also called for, as, as many others have as well, um, debt relief, uh, uh, funding for, uh, for these countries to build back, to, first to, uh, to just infuse the population and, and enterprises with cash, but to do so in a way that leads to a more sustainable recovery. Um, we have a four pillar response at the ILO, um, stimulate the economy and employment, supporting enterprises, jobs and incomes, protecting workers in the workplace, and finally, uh, uh, as always, relying on social dialogue for strong solutions. Many governments are working along these four principles, and uh, what we really see is uh, that countries are rediscovering, if you will, the need for strong employment relationships, the need for strong social protection systems. This is the challenge as we try to build back better, or as, as we describe it um, in our centenary declaration on the future of work, uh, building a human-centered future of work that places people and the work they do at the center of recovery. So this is what, uh, this is ongoing work that really has, has just begun, but we'll need to look at this immediate phase as the beginning of uh, a sustainable recovery. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Deborah. Uh, you mentioned the last year's celebrations and obviously declaration and the focus on the future, uh, future of work. And it was uh, really strong, uh, uh, put strong presence of ILO in the multilateral discussions. But now uh, you, we have uh, some element of the back to the future as we are now uh, seeing with, uh, with uh, the COVID-19 and rather fundamental and basic uh, 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 human rights of the workers. And you address this issue, what uh, ILO is doing and uh, what governments worldwide are doing uh, to solve this problem, immediate tangible problem for millions of the people who, who lost their job. Uh, there is also possibility to some sort of a reset, as the World Economic Forum said, to uh, create a new jobs, to link it to the green economy, and to create a new dynamism. While we are dealing with the uh, old traditional issues which emerged in such a drastic way with the pandemic crisis, what are the what are those uh, ideas and discussions uh, in ILO on the on the this linkages to new jobs, green economy, and the new dynamism in this field? Well, we are having very intense discussions um, on these issues and we expect those to continue. For example, uh, we'll be having a virtual summit uh, at the beginning of July, both regional and global, where we expect that at a regional level and also at a global level, a number of these issues um, will be discussed. For us, the future of work, which we focused on so intensively over several years, and it culminated in our centenary declaration of literally a year ago, that future of work is here. It's here, maybe not as we anticipated, but it's here. And so those principles uh, really need to be the thread that carries us into a sustainable recovery. And what I would say is that we have been talking about uh, what we call the just transition for quite a long time. So what we talk about in the Centenary Declaration um, is the human-centered future of work, which we might call a better future of work now as opposed to a, a better normal or a new normal. It really focuses on uh, people's capabilities uh, and the institutions of work as well as enabling environments for enterprises. We have an enormous opportunity 
to build towards a carbon neutral economy. Um, not arbitrarily, but we've seen uh, the, the massive need for jobs that has come out of the crisis. Uh, many sectors uh, are on their knees and are really going to have a tremendous uh, uh, challenge in recovering. For us, the work on just transition started several years ago uh, with our guidelines on a just transition, which really talk about how we need to move people and enterprises into highly productive, but uh, climate sound, if you will, ways of working. We think that there are millions of jobs to be gained in this way and millions of, uh, of enterprises that can thrive in this kind of environment. This is very much linked to uh, the Director General's remarks uh, to mark the World Environment Day just last week, where he emphasized that building back better means building back green. Because environmental sustainability and the human-centered approach to the future of work are really one and the same. Uh, and this is where our Just Transition guidelines and our Centenary Declaration come into play. We also have an opportunity to dispel um, the kind of false polarity that we see between, um, economic, between climate sustainability, environmental sustainability, and economic sustainability. These two are not at odds with each other when we do our analysis and we see that yes, some jobs, some enterprises may not uh, survive because of climate uh, factors, but working together, we can employ everyone productively, we can transform economies and support enterprises uh, in, uh, in the quest for, uh, for climate, uh, for a better climate for everyone. We will be, um, heading the Secretary General's Climate Action for Jobs Initiative, which got underway right before the pandemic. And we intend to pursue it vigorously as uh, a key pillar for the recovery. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, one, a few keywords from uh, your uh, statement are justice, uh, climate change, and also question if we can have win-win solution or we'll have to make trade-offs. And it's just one question for the discussion later on and for our participants. Ideally, we should have win-win solutions, but the reality of modern world that we will have often uh, to have to make some choices and trade-offs. Now we're moving uh, to, uh, to the next, uh, next sort of uh, topic, which is closely related to what Deborah was discussing. We have with us uh, Jeanne Varc, uh, as you know, uh, our good colleague and prominent uh, representative in International Geneva Scene, representing Microsoft and contributing a lot to inclusive discussion on the digital governance. I will introduce uh, uh, um, uh, his intervention with a few slides. The first slide is, uh, as you can see here, is comparison between revenue of few companies and the countries. Uh, in this case, uh, it was the, I think the Microsoft was close to Slovakia and Apple uh, was uh, close to uh, 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 Portugal. If Microsoft were a country, it, was, it would have been the 65th country according to GDP. Data is from 2017. And we have another slide showing uh, how uh, much cash, uh, how uh, cash reserves countries uh, have uh, comparing to companies. And you can see that uh, uh, after Japan, uh, Apple is uh, more powerful and has more cash reserves than Singapore, German, United Kingdom, United States, alphabet is closed. We don't have Microsoft here. Now, what has been happening over the last three months is a huge shift in the economic power of uh, uh, old companies, airline companies, uh, Walmart, uh, other traditional players are losing ground because of the COVID and tech companies are gaining uh, in their economic might and in their re relevance, and they're also increasing their social responsibility. As Mark indicated uh, in his introductory uh, statement, uh, this general issue becomes very concrete 
when it comes to taxes and uh, should uh, tech companies uh, be much more diligent and responsible uh, taxpayer and through that to contribute to the revenues and the social and the overall social safety net of the countries world. The statistics is not very good currently. We have statistics that, uh, that for example, Facebook uh, paid just 28 million uh, sterling in corporate taxes in the UK last year, despite achieving a record 1.6 billion sales. And uh, this is the question, uh, Jani, which, with which we can uh, uh, kick off the discussion about responsibility above the business sector and very concrete issues. Should uh, uh, how uh, big uh, tech companies can contribute uh, more to tax revenue and in that to the more sustainable, sustainable and robust society? Over to you. Thank you, uh, Jovan. Uh, thank you for, for this question. Um, I'll make uh, three, three main points uh, in response to your question. Uh, the first one is that um, it's quite clear that recovery from the pandemic um, will require a collective effort. Um, all individuals or companies will need to contribute to the recovery uh, from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. That's the first point. Second, and as to the role of the uh, IT companies uh, in this recovery, um, I think that uh, digital technology, uh, which is developed and deployed by those companies, will be an important enabler uh, in the uh, recovery. Uh, IT has played this role as an enabler throughout uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the digital technologies uh, have enabled people to remain connected uh, with each other. Uh, they have enabled business uh, to continue operating. They have enabled teachers to continue teaching. Um, they have also enabled organizations such as the World Health Organization collect data, which has enabled us uh, to monitor the progress uh, of the pandemic and therefore to prepare better uh, the response to the pandemic. So the, the, the list would be long, I think, of um, this uh, enabling role which uh, the IT and digital technologies have played uh, during the pandemic. Um, I think that the IT will continue to play that same role as an enabler, as an enabling uh, party in the recovery. Uh, but I think that industry will also need, and that goes to your point, we need to, to scale up uh, and to increase its contribution to what I would call uh, the new social contract, you know, this new contract which binds us all, uh, which is new in my view because it needs to build on the learnings from uh, from the recovery uh, from the, from the pandemic and try to address uh, some of those issues that have appeared uh, during uh, the pandemic. Um, I think that the digital technologies and IT industry will be able to play that role of enabler to contribute more. Uh, let me give you a few examples. I think that uh, it will be important for the IT, tech, for the IT companies to uh, contribute by enabling access to all. I mean, think about those that did not have access during the pandemic, lack of information, lack of information on status. So that is part of the contribution that IT companies will have to the social contract in the context of the recovery, providing access to all, leaving no one behind, as we all say. That's also a role there for IT companies. Um, partnering with uh, NGOs to provide education, digital skills, uh, to, uh, to, to, in particular to the undeserved uh, population, uh, and prepare them for new jobs. And gaining access, as I was saying, is also enabling the exercise of fundamental rights. Um, uh, partnering with NGOs to provide education and skills is also an important part of enabling the exercise and the full enjoyment of uh, universal rights, um, uh, human rights, in including in this case, uh, right to a decent work in the 21st century. Um, another thing that I think uh, IT companies will need to do, and this goes very much to what uh, Deborah was just saying uh, in the response to the previous question, is to develop uh, and deploy technologies that will help create a more sustainable future for all. So for me, this is definitely 
a very important aspect of uh, IT companies' contribution to the recovery and to this new social contract that we need to have in, in the recovery. Now, my third point relates to, to uh, your question uh, on taxation and the question um, of multinational tax contribution to, um, to the recovery. I mean, this question of multinational tax contribution, you know, it predates COVID. Um, I think it's possible that the very significant uh, public deficits uh, that result from the huge financial packages which government have put together and are uh, giving to companies, to in particular small and medium enterprises uh, throughout the world, I think it's, it's likely that these significant public deficits will, will make the question of tax contributions by multinationals, including IT industry, but not only, I mean, will make that questions more pressing, more acute, but I mean, we, I think we also need to recognize that this is a question which is linked to structural factors which are wholly and, and largely unrelated to, to the COVID. So that would be the three points that would make um, a contribution by, by everyone, contribution by the IT industry in a number of respects which are conducive to the full enjoyment of human rights. Um, and finally, probably um, making the, the recovery and the financial, the public deficits, making that question of taxation, fair taxation, uh, more, more acute, more pressing. And we will need to continue the discussion. Uh, but again, it is something which is not really related it, to structural factors which are not related to COVID, I, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Yves, uh, for bringing also the question of the digital social contract. Uh, for colleagues who are not in, involved in the cyber digital discussion, Microsoft has been proposing digital Geneva Convention. There were, there are quite a few proposals coming from Microsoft as a building blocks for the new understanding uh, of society and security field. And you just added a few points and thank you for highlighting very important role of tech sector, which uh, played in, in order to have a business continuity of the modern world, starting from us here uh, working at the UN and uh, people worldwide. Therefore, it is, it is a remarkable uh, development uh, which helped the previous tech clash, uh, but also, as you said, put some traditional issues in the sharper focus, like uh, issue of taxation. Therefore, we have uh, quite a few building blocks on, the, on this social contract. Uh, Jean-Yves, uh, just a brief, uh, brief comment. Uh, what uh, uh, will Microsoft and tech industry bring into the, this, uh, well, not negotiation official, but social discussion about elements of the social contract? Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who invented, who wrote the book, he thought about social contract only for the uh, city of Geneva. Uh, can we have a global social contract and what would be the role of uh, tech companies? Yeah, I think um, that um, this, this, is a, this is a very, very good question, um, which to a large, to, to, to large extent is, um, again, unrelated to COVID-19. Um, but if you want, my view on that question is, is that uh, there has been, to a large extent, um, today a disconnect between the way the economy uh, has evolved over the past 15 years, uh, with, um, uh, and in effect, with the help of countries to a large extent, um, helping, facilitating, and encouraging companies to go abroad or to expand uh, on an international level. And so while we have seen this expansion of companies and of businesses uh, at an international level over the past 20, 30 years, uh, and therefore um, facilitating and, and, and um, encouraging this globalization of the economy, at the same time, we have seen states um, uh, and the sovereignty powers remaining very much into a territorial scope. And for me, there is the disconnect that we see today between global economies, which have been uh, to a large extent carried and remain carried by, by multinational companies. And then on, on, on the other hand, um, if you want a, a series um, of um, uh, sovereignties and territorial sovereignties which are e next to each other. And I think we need much more cooperation 
among states to address the challenges which are raised by the globalization of the economy today. That is definitely the case uh, in the tech sector, uh, which uh, of all industries, I think, is one which has a global dimension uh, and where we know, and in fact, you are one who knows that very well, um, uh, an industry which um, to some extent needs, I think, more regulation, needs more governance. Uh, and therefore that's, that's a place where we will see uh, hopefully states coming together to provide that governance to the industry. Thank you, thank you, uh, the, uh, thank you, Janiv. Uh, social contract, um, uh, more uh, smart regulation and trade-off. We move to Doro. Doro, the, this discussion of social contract put an excellent, uh, excellent, uh, uh, canvas for your intervention on the future of the economic models. Do we continue with emphasis on the economic growth at all costs, or we do uh, introduce some new types of uh, uh, economic models as a part of this social contract that already uh, um, um, were in introduced and emphasized by, by previous two speakers? What is your take on the, on the outline of the social contract? Thank you, Jovan, and thank you for inviting me to this interesting conversation. And the previous contributors have already outlined the premises um, of my work, so that's really helpful. Um, the question, you know, whether um, uh, companies are actually ready for um, what some organizations, and most recently call, um, the World Economic Forum calls the Great Reset, I think is an excellent question. I certainly concur with your observations that the notions of building back better and just recovery are really gaining traction and it gains traction across all stakeholder groups, businesses included, as we've just also heard from Microsoft. Um, and I think for many, this pandemic has triggered a fundamental reflection on the role that they ought to play in a globalized economy. Um, so let me answer your, your question in, in two parts, um, whether companies are ready first, and then secondly, and probably more critically, um, do companies actually know how to be ready and how to build back better? And that then links to the social contract and the business models that we already touched upon. Um, so I think if this pandemic has shown one thing for companies, it is that they need to be ready. Uh, it's not optional. Um, and uh, it has clearly shown that cosmetic fixes um, that they have sometimes subsumed under the label of corporate social responsibility clearly won't do the trick because any efforts that are just mere additions to business as usual will not help. Um, they will not help to make global supply chains more resilient. Um, they will not help to increase the motivation of own employees that flexibly had to adjust to a new work situation. And this reckoning through the crisis, I think does open up opportunities to highlight alternative business models, models that fully, great, fully integrate, for example, human rights, and that's my focus area, um, into core business operations. Um, there are also, of course, an increasing number of external um, drivers for companies to be ready. And I just want to mention some of those key drivers. And one certainly is regulation. Um, the, uh, uh, human, the mandatory human rights due diligence regulation is on the rise um, across Europe. France already has the Loi de Vigilance currently underway in Switzerland as a responsible business initiative. And even if the text of this legislation may remain weak in parliamentary compromises and in their implementation, they still send a really strong signal to what's, what a large public expects from corporations. Um, secondly, I want to point to investors. Um, in the past weeks, I've read so much about the rise of ESG data. Um, this is data that helps investors to assess the environmental, social, and governance risks um, that uh, their investments have. And so companies feel, I think, increasing pressure to demonstrate that they are in control of environmental, social, and governance risks. Um, and then thirdly, I want to point to what is considered an intangible business value, namely trust. Uh, I've closely followed the Edelman Trust um, surveys that they conducted throughout the pandemic. 
And um, the most recent ones shows that only 43% of respondents believe that business is doing a good job protecting workers during this pandemic. This is a rather sobering um, number and shows that businesses can and need to do better. And taken together, I think these external drivers um, are overwhelmingly convincing that businesses need to be ready. Um, then second, I think more critical is the question, do companies actually know how to be ready? And um, do they know how to develop business models that um, allow them to respect um, business rights, uh, human rights, but also um, grow their business at the same time? Um, five years ago, the Economist Intelligence Unit conducted a survey amongst over 600 um, senior executives and over 80% um, responded and said, yes, 80, um, human rights really matter for business. But then as they were asked, well, how do you implement human rights in your, your business? Um, the respondents were pretty lost and said, actually, they don't really understand what's expected from them. And I don't think this picture has changed significantly in the past five years. But I do believe it helps that we can point to some individual examples now that uh, of companies that have already prior to the pandemic um, transitioned to business models that make human rights an integral part um, of their corporate decision making and their supply chain management. And most concretely, I want to um, point to companies in the fashion industry. It's an industry that has been in the spotlight um, during this crisis, um, particularly um, regarding the treatment of their suppliers in Bangladesh. I've researched this industry for many years and also followed closely how the pandemic plays out in places like Bangladesh and for workers in that supply chain, arguably the weakest links. Um, so companies um, like uh, Nike or H&M and Decathlon um, they have, uh, I would argue, already prior to the pandemic transitioned to a business model that is not exclusively focused on prices when they engage in sourcing, but they consider a range of factors when they decide to work with a supplier, including um, delivery, reliability, quality, etc. Also, establishing um, labor rights in the facilities that produce their goods. Um, so, in that um, context, labor rights then become one business factor that these um, corporations um, consider. And they create longer term relationships with their suppliers, which is beneficial for truly establishing um, uh, labor rights in these um, production facilities. So they have moved away from what I would call a transitional business model to a truly relationship based model. And this has been beneficial during the crisis because Many other brands have been accused of cutting off ties with suppliers the moment that shops had to close in Europe. The brands that I just mentioned, H&M, Nike, and Decathlon, didn't do that. Instead, they understood that the way how they treat their suppliers during the pandemic will help them during the recovery, namely to pick up business, to help them establish factories that have the infrastructure um, that is aligned with COVID precautions, for example, um, and uh, that um, also helps them to um, maintain the trust that they have built over many years and that can be lost within uh, a very short um, period of time. So it's those brands that I think are better positioned for a quick recovery um, after this time. Thank and you. I think we need to, to let me finish just one thing. I think we need more of these companies that pioneer and experiment with business models. Um, we've heard uh, in the ICT context from Microsoft and um, they're not perfect, but I think um, they can really lead the way in different industry contexts to also establish human rights standards um, beyond their individual companies. And I'm leading the Geneva Center since last November I'm uh, keen to support companies in developing business models that allow profits and principles to coexist. And I certainly believe that the time to accelerate these initial um, explorations is now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Contributing all of these elements to our social contract, uh, investors, uh, trust, question of justice, uh, Pressure from public and excellent. I'm uh, I'm I'm losing my trust with my co-moderator because I eat all the time with the, my speakers who were 
excellent, but I'm sure that it will will extend the session a bit because it's really, really would be would be sort of a, a, a waste to 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 lose such a great uh, uh, inputs. Uh, Mark, uh, I hope uh, I'm not persona non grata on your side. Over to you. <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm just a good disciple of you, Jovan. I, I, I've learned uh, from you about how uh, to do the, organize these meetings and the three key points of the five minutes. <laughs> um, no, it was great. It was really interesting conversations and interventions and presentations. So thank you to the speakers. And actually my question, which is to Michael uh, Addo, actually follows on very nicely from Doro's uh, answers and points just now. And it is this question of the wider societal responsibilities of businesses. Uh, Michael, you were uh, in the working group, UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights for six years, I, I recall. Um, and that was a key part of your job, really, was to show businesses that they have those wider responsibilities, especially in the area of human rights, and to give them guidance about how to go about doing that. So two parts to the question. Firstly, as you've watched what's gone on with business uh, during COVID-19, do you think they, they have learnt those lessons uh, that you uh, tried to teach them during your six years on the working group? Um, and secondly, um, and again, going a little bit to what Doro said, she spoke a lot about the human rights and business uh, angle. But when we talk about societal responsibilities, should we widen that and say that businesses not only uh, should respect and, and promote human rights, uh, but they should also be um, working to protect the environment or at least making sure they don't uh, damage the environment, the climate, uh, they don't get involved in corruption. So these wider societal points, or is that too much and they're really just going to focus on profit? Michael. Right. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Now, just to say one or two things in, to complement Doro's uh, excellent uh, contribution um, on the subject of human rights in business, um, I think we've come a very long way. Uh, we've come away from the days when human rights were often seen as um, unacceptable social interference in the market, because now we see human rights as part of the market uh, process. So the way we even think about human rights now is part of the way we conduct um, the business. Um, and then when it comes to the practice, um, the emerging international standards are gradually being accepted as excellent platforms to uh, incorporate human rights um, into business. So when it comes to talk, um, it's great. But when it comes to walking, I'm afraid it's not so easy. Um, a lot of the companies have made commitments in support of human rights. Uh, a lot of them have training programs. A lot of them actually have supply chain contracts, such as um, Doro is saying. But actually, when they really genuinely confronted with economic profit and human rights, very few of them actually succeed uh, in actually prioritizing human rights. But it's not the end of the matter. Um, most of these changes are with the big multinational companies, leaving behind the biggest elephant in the room, which is the small and medium-sized enterprises that actually make up something like 95 to 99% of most countries' economies that have no clue, have no support, have no capacity. And in fact, ironically, under intense pressure from the transnational corporations um, to actually act as if human rights were not important. So in general, even though the thinking has improved, the practice is not so, so, so straightforward. So then to the real question, which is whether they've learned anything by, uh, uh, in the COVID uh, uh, environment. Well, I think the data on how companies have handled COVID will come out a little bit more uh, robustly later. I don't think we have all the data yet. Um, and I think we've heard a little bit more from Deborah, we had a little bit more from um, uh, uh, Doro. Uh, but I think the real data will show. Now, the anecdotal data that we have actually can be drawn from the levels of unemployment post-COVID, showing how many companies have rather chosen to lay workers off very, uh, uh, very quickly. 
in countries where we've had, such as the UK, where we have a furlough system, and the idea was a complementary relationship between government and business, government providing a certain proportion of salaries up to a maximum, and then the companies providing a certain proportion. Most companies never provided that complementary, uh, in this case, to 20%. So again, you realize that they would rather use it um, uh, to, cut, to cut costs. Uh, and then the supply chain system is not so, so perfect because when it comes to particular sectors, um, I think Doro's example on the um, apparel system is probably an exception, but places like the agriculture sector and, and, and others like the manufacturing sector are not so particularly good. So in principle, I think COVID really posed a challenge. And so it makes us re-examine where we thought we think we should be going with business and human rights. And you ask the question, should we be looking beyond business and human rights? Well, business and human rights as a label, it's actually one that has some very good pedigree. And it also has some very good traction. Companies are referring to it, governments are using it, civil society groups are using it. And it's been building up for the last 40 years and certainly has settled comfortably in the last 10 years with um, the UN guiding principles and the OECD guidelines. But we also know that progress is very slow. And in fact, to say that progress is slow is being very generous. In fact, progress has been pretty, pretty awful. Um, and the reason, of course, is that um, the subject itself remains very sensitive. Um, on the working group, one of the key cautionary statements is, please be sure to have everybody on board. You, you, you're being required to please everybody, and therefore you're finding that you're not pleasing anybody. And that sensitivity has actually led to a very cautionary approach. And the other thing is that, you know, business and human rights essentially an entire cultural transformation. We're changing how business is thinking, how business works, how societies relate to business, and therefore it's slow. And because it's slow, we tend to pick up individual um, uh, ideas like procurement, or we, we go looking for gender perspectives, or we look for very specific. And because we're dealing with it in a very specific way, the progress is not very noticeable. Well, if you look very carefully, as you suggested, that there are some very broad and very deep thematic areas where it would be a lot easier to blend the human rights objectives into a lot of what we already have. And anti-corruption is one of those you mentioned. Climate change is one. And I was very pleased to see from Deborah's uh, presentation how the ILO is incorporating environmental sustainability and climate change into workers' rights. And the idea being that the objectives of business and human rights and some of these issues come together. And it allows us to argue, for example, that if you can encourage businesses to eliminate anti-corruption from their businesses, you don't have to even worry about how procurement bids are put up because anti-corruption is probably one of the biggest um, challenges in, in procurement. So if you can actually remove that, you can actually then begin to think of workers' rights, you can think of all that. So maybe this is the time that we begin to have this kind of conversation, not dropping business and human rights, but actually taking human rights into that broad thematic environment of anti-corruption, climate change, environmental sustainability, maybe even development and, and the sustainable development goals, for example, uh, could be a lot more effective way, moving it a lot faster than the way we have it at the moment. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. Covered a huge amount of ground uh, very quickly. Um, normally we had a, a gr another graph to show, but I, we don't have time. So I'll just quickly... Um, comment on some of the results. It shows the projected job losses in different regions of the world. And the numbers really are horrific in terms of uh, the job losses that uh, are uh, presumed will happen because of COVID-19. For example, over 60 million job losses in Asia Pacific and around 13 million in, in Europe. Um, actually, we can see that on the screen. Um, I'm now going to turn, while you all digest uh, that, to Ellen. Fortunately, I don't need to say, try and do, uh, say your, your family name a second time, Ellen. Um, but in the first poll, uh, which mentioned Denmark, actually, about that it hasn't provided financial support to companies that are registered in tax havens, I want to 
uh, talk about that or hear your views on that. And especially, could you discuss the advantages and disadvantages of those kinds of clauses uh, from a business and human rights perspective, Ellen? Thank you, and, and, and thanks for having me uh, on, on the panel. Very uh, interesting indeed to hear from, from other panelists. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll, be, um, I'll try to be brief as uh, we don't have much time. Um, so, so indeed, as, as you highlighted, uh, Denmark, as well as other countries have including, included in, in the recovery packages some specific clauses about uh, companies registered in, in tax havens not being eligible. And, um, you know, we, we all agree here that, uh, you know, taxation is an essential um, part of, of domestic resource mobilization. It is what is going to support realization of, of human rights, especially in, in the post-COVID uh, uh, era. Uh, and it is very important political signaling. And I think, you know, we saw from this little poll that there is huge support for this type of measures. So, of course, this is, you know, very welcome. However, um, you know, if you look at what's behind it, and I just want to underline here that I'm no way a tax expert, uh, but has been relying on the analysts that actually know what they're talking about, is that this type of clauses actually do not really have any sort of uh, practical consequence, because uh, the only countries that are listed um, are the ones that... Um, you know, or uh, within the EU list of so-called non-cooperative jurisdiction for tax purposes, and uh, do not list any of the, uh, also, you know, the, the EU countries themselves that are, um, you know, in a more subtle way, maybe enabling corporations to escape taxes. So as far as I, I understand uh, those tax clauses, uh, they're not really very efficient. And uh, I would say that it would be good for states to actually consult uh, tax experts, including from civil society, on, on, you know, what type of clauses would actually be efficient. Uh, now, um, there are other types of, of clauses that have been included in, in recovery packages and that I think we can also discuss here. Um, Denmark did also mention uh, specifically uh, the UN guiding principles as being, you know, a standard that companies need to respect. Uh, which uh, we believe is, is, is very important. And, you know, as, as many speakers before me highlighted, um, you know, human rights due diligence is, um, is, is, is a way for uh, companies to actually be contributing to transforming uh, our, our current economy to a more uh, human rights uh, compliant uh, economy. Um, but there again, uh, the, the clause on, 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 on respect for the UN guiding principles, for example, hasn't really been uh, unpacked. What does it mean? How will we know who is respecting uh, the UN guiding principles and so on? Uh, then also, I think, uh, coming back what, uh, um, what, what Dorothy said uh, around uh, the need for regulation. I mean, it's not only in relation to this very specific uh, economic uh, and financial packages that be businesses might benefit from, that human rights due diligence is important. So I think, you know, now is the time to also move the conversation towards looking at what are the efficient and smart ways of regulating businesses uh, through human rights due diligence obligations uh, that will then um, address some of the, of the challenges uh, of, of you know, of globalization that were highlighted before by, by Jean-Yves and, uh, you know, what states can, can do. Uh, we have now a window of opportunity with the European Union that is looking a bit more seriously into devising some, some pieces of legislation. And I think uh, this is the, the right time to look at what are smart models that can be adopted at the state level or at EU level to actually be, be impacting on how um, uh, companies are integrating human rights. Um, then I also think that, you know, they, they, the, the recovery packages are also a very powerful way to, um, to integrate some additional um, requirements on, on, on businesses. There hasn't been that much around uh, uh, requirements on cutting carbon emissions, 
um, and, and then as, as uh, you know, the ILO uh, reminded us, uh, there's uh, a lot of things that can be done to, to require companies to preserve employment, uh, include um, uh, the unions in, 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 uh, in these discussions as well. Uh, and then finally, I think on these recovery packages, what is uh, very important is to make sure that there are some oversight mechanisms to make sure that they're actually being implemented so that uh, there is transparency uh, in who is going to benefit from them, who is going to, to look at uh, um, how these requirements are being implemented in practice. Thank you, Erin. As you mentioned at the beginning, we're, as we're rapidly running out of time, um, obviously you uh, work for an NHRI, a very active and important one. Uh, the second question, if I could ask you to uh, integrate it into your response to the questions from the audience, that would be uh, great because that will allow us to hear from the audience. Um, just to let everybody know that we have the agreement of Diplo and Zoom and everybody necessary to extend by 10 minutes. Uh, so thank you for your patience. Uh, we're now going to go to the questions from the audience and we're going to start with a question from a youth perspective from Mark um, from the Model UN, who hopefully we can see on the screen, who has a question for the Deputy Director General. Mark, good to see you. Thank you very much for letting me ask my question. Uh, yes, I would like to ask my question to the Deputy Director General of um, for Policy at the International Labour Organization. Um, so many of the young people currently looking for their first job are facing a tough situation as data already shows that vacancies have drastically decreased um, and we also know that young workers entering the job market during a recession can suffer from lasting negative impacts on their careers um, my question is what do we know from previous recessions that could help facilitate young people's entry into the job market during this recession. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Uh, before you answer that, uh, Deborah, uh, I'll read some other questions from the audience and then we'll go back through the experts and you'll each have one minute to prepare yourselves uh, to respond. The next question was to uh, Jean-Yves um, and it was how to make tech companies more accountable in implementing or respecting human rights in their products and their services. The next question was to Doro, uh, and this is, what is the role of competition law uh, in the context of business and human rights during the pandemic and as we look towards uh, recovery post-pandemic or post-crisis? A question to Michael uh, from Virginia. Um, how do uh, how do we need address long term health concerns uh, during um, the crisis, but also building back better? So I guess this goes to the wider socio economic uh, building back better um, aspects, especially of course from your perspective, business and human rights. So I guess there you're getting into health service providers and uh, pharmaceutical companies vaccine uh, pro producers, very interesting question. Um, and then uh, to Elin, uh, is the new normal really an artificial situation that actually sacrifices the safety of citizens uh, that should be provided? Um, a provocative question there. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll start with Deborah in answer to Mark's question. Deborah, you have one minute, please. Thanks, Mark, for your question. What we know that we have to avoid uh, in general is that young people entering the job market spend long periods of time fruitlessly looking for a job. This is what economists call a scarring effect because it does affect um, in a very negative way uh, the long-term work trajectory of, of that young person into, uh, into adulthood all the way through um, all the way through his or her working life. And that was uh, demonstrated quite clearly uh, in the Great Recession. Now, we point very often uh, at the ILO to the EU Youth Guarantee, which was an initiative 
developed after the Great Recession. It was really a, an attempt to keep young people from remaining outside of the workforce uh, or outside of study for extended periods of time. So the, the youth guarantee is a guarantee that uh, young people in all EU states uh, will receive a quality offer of employment, study, or training within four months of leaving school or university. Now, this requires tremendous resources. There's no question about it. But that kind of comprehensive uh, policy can be very successful. Um, it was implemented in 2014, and we know that the share of young people not in employment, education, or training in the EU, it's known as the NEAT rate, has fallen dramatically. Uh, in 2019, prior to the crisis, uh, the NEAT rate stood at 10.6%, which is less than half the global, global average of 22.2%. So we, there are solutions. They require resources and political will, and they require global solidarity to support countries that can't uh, implement the, those policies on their own. Thanks. Thank you, Deborah. A great response, hopefully reassuring to those people graduating at the moment. Uh, the second question then was to Jean-Yves. Jean-Yves, you have one minute, please. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, how to uh, make the companies more accountable? Uh, I think it's, a, it's really a question of, uh, it's a combination of different things uh, that, that could be put into place. As you know, uh, the guiding principles on business and human rights apply. Uh, to to our companies um, and how do we you know incentivize companies to respect uh, those principles? I think that there are, as I said, a, a many of things that, that that can be done. Um, soft incentives. Um, I think education is something which is very important. And some of you on this panel have already heard me say several times that I I truly believe that we need to have human rights education included into business administration courses. We need to tell uh, a business, uh, future business leaders about uh, their human rights responsibilities. So education is one thing. Peer example is something else which works well. We're working a lot with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to come and talk to businesses in other regions about what we do uh, in terms of in, uh, human rights implementation. Now, the last one, since it's one minute, where I think that it's a strong incentive is also to have investors investors be demanding on the companies that they respect human rights. And I think that investors have really a key role to play here in, in helping um, companies, encouraging companies to, 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 to comply with human rights, to respect human rights and, and to protect uh, human rights. So, uh, both very soft and increasingly more demanding uh, on companies. If you talk about finance, uh, you'll get them. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Jean-Yves. Doro, difficult question. I'm glad you're answering this rather than me. Competition <laughs> law. <laughs> well, first of all, Jean-Yves, thank you for highlighting the critical role of business education. <laughs> um, to the question, difficult question, but I've, I've heard it many times before. So what is the role of competition law? Uh, I refer to a number of leading um, senior executives that place human rights in a so-called pre-competitive space. Um, and to uh, what is what is helpful is if companies and other stakeholders can agree on industry standards because those industry standards even if they're voluntary create then a level playing field that equalizes what's expected concretely expected from companies in a specific industry context um, it clarifies for everyone what's expected so that's helpful and um, yes I hope we can treat human rights in this free competitive space Thank you. Uh, very good and very concise uh, response. Uh, next, Michael. I probably completely ruined the question because it was a long question. I tried to shorten it. But I think it was about yeah, the particular role of businesses in a, a right to health context. Well, thank you. Maybe because the question is so short, I'll try and give a very short answer. Um, some very, very basic things that before health service became, or health provision became a business or a commercial undertaking, it was a service. It was a service provided by the state. And since businesses have become deeply involved, we are missing and losing that service dimension. 
And if we had to look back at it as that particular service, we can then, then link it up as a human right. Because as you know, the Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights does guarantee um, an enjoyment for highest attainable uh, human right. So it seems to me we need to go back to basics um, in trying to redefine what it is these businesses are doing. Uh, and in the instance of uh, providing for health, just to keep reminding them that actually it is a human right and it is a service. And to that extent, they really have to make their primary um, uh, objective, uh, the people who actually benefit from it, rather than to make profit exclusively. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Ellen, the question to you, I think, was closely related to that. It was really, is, is it this new normal where in some countries the state is essentially outsourcing those services, like health services, to the private sector? Is that uh, correct? And in that uh, linked with that or separate to that, maybe you can mention a little bit about the role of NHRIs and Building Back Better, please. Sure. Um, so, so I think it's uh, you know interesting to to speak about this this new normal. But uh, you know, if we look at at the human rights situation that we're experiencing now, um, the sort of foundation for these sort of negative human rights impacts were already there. So what we're seeing is just you know an exacerbation of uh, uh, you know abuses on on workers' rights down the supply chains. It is uh, around also the issues of of uh, uh, you know delivery of of, uh, of services by both the state and and, and companies. Uh, it's about um, uh, you know, gender uh, equality, and it's about, you know, inequalities uh, more broadly. Uh, I also think, you know, we've been, we have seen how this crisis has exacerbated the situation of civil and political rights. So, you know, I think it's, it's you know, the new normal has been there for a while. And, and what we experience is just the, the peak of, of, of this new normal uh, in a sort of crisis situation. Um, so, um, you know, coming back to sort of the role of, of national human rights institutions, I think, you know, there is really a critical role for these independent state institutions to play. There are important accountability mechanisms for what the state is doing, uh, and they increasingly have shown in, in recent years that they can also look at what the private sector is doing. Um, of course, you know, there's the nexus between the state and, and the private sector that NHRIs are really mandated to look at, uh, but many uh, NHRIs can actually also be monitoring what the private sector is doing. Um, then very quickly on, on what uh, NHRIs have been doing and can do in relation to this particular crisis, I think we've really seen how NHRIs have been monitoring, uh, you know, emergency legislation, uh, restrictions on civil liberties, but also keeping an eye on how um, you know, um, environmental and, and labor rights protections might be uh, lowered uh, during this crisis when there is no oversight by parliament, civil society, etc. cetera. Um, and then I think, you know, um, in addition to that sort of reactive stance and protective uh, role that NHRIs play, they can really step up on being part of the conversation on the building back better, uh, you know, look at what is including in those recovery package, engaging in discussions around the role of, of business in essential services, engage in um, uh, regulating uh, or, you know, the policy environment for, for, for business. And I, and I think that's, that's very much what, what uh, NHRIs can do and, and I hope will be doing in, in, in the near future. So I'll stop there. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, while you were speaking, at least three or four new participants joined the meeting, which either means that you spoke very well and you were really convincing everybody to join, or that they got the time wrong. I'll, I'll leave it to you to decide which uh, of those two, but thank you to all those great questions and great answers. Uh, before I hand back to Jovan for some short final remarks, I think we have a last poll and nearly everybody has stayed in the meeting on, across all the platforms. So uh, thank you for that. And I think it reflects the great presentations that we've heard. So the question, the last survey of this series of Right On, which system will be most disrupted by COVID-19? Okay, there we go. Jovan, over to you for... Thank you. Last reflections. 
Thank, Thank you. you, Mark. We uh, we went over the over the scheduled time, but there is a simple reason, and I would hope a justifiable reason that uh, we started drafting the uh, digital social contract, and uh, our uh, presenters added quite a few really remarkable points. Here is our drawing uh, about the drafting of the digital social contract throughout the history. Different social contracts were written by Confucius, Lao Tzu, Socrates, and other thinkers, and more recently by Grotius, Hobbes, Locke, David. And we are now around one of these tables. And uh, we as a government, academia, technical community, civil society, businesses, and other, and the other actors. Uh, our discussion provided many building blocks, many um, points for the emerging uh, digital social contract uh, or general social contract. And I'm sure that this discussion inspired you to start thinking what should be the lines and chapters, especially on this critical issue of interplay between business, justice, employment and environment. This is really a great wrap up of our series of uh, discussions. And I would like once more to thank uh, all of you who attended today's sessions and who were patient to stay longer with us, to thank our partners uh, um, in addition to Universal Rights Group and uh, Geneva Internet Platform and Diplo, also our core partners, the Geneva Academy of Human Rights, Essex University, University and other, other partners. And in particular to thank two persons who made this possible. Uh, Natasha and Charlotte, Natasha from Diplo Foundation, who is uh, this uh, hardworking person behind the scene and Charlotte from the Universal Right Group. With this, I, I would like to invite you to contribute to the sustainability of the tourism industry during the summer and not to forget us and join us uh, in uh, September when we will continue with the monthly ed editions on uh, Right On. Have a nice day and uh, see you in September. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.